So good morning, everybody. Uh, as well as having a long uh, period of time in my career at client side, I'm now an independent agency owner. So kudos to you guys, because thank you. Now, now I know how it feels. <laughs> um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to talk about is, is something that's occurred to me over the last few years. And whilst, of course, the world moves on in marketing, particularly with uh, you know, digital, changing everything, but whilst we obsess about things like Facebook likes and programmatic and, and things like this, I would argue that we still haven't addressed some of the basics. Because every year, 80 to 90% of new products still fail, and we don't really know why. And it's been like that for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, and marketing is all, what, is all about behavior change. That's it. In essence, it's about behavior change, getting someone to switch to your brand or service or product and to buy more of it and to continue to do so. Um, and yet we have things like this happening. You know, a very big brand relaunched from the pack in the background to the pack in the foreground. It passed, uh, the new pack passed all of the benchmarks in Qual and Quant. They put it on shelf and then they had to withdraw it after six weeks because they lost $27 million in sales. So how come? How come when um, people in focus groups were asked which of these two packs they preferred and which they would buy, the majority of people said, I'd buy the one on the left, and the reason is because the cookies look bigger. <laughs> but the brand owner decided to test both packs in store, and under normal conditions of purchase, this is what happened. Because when we're under time pressure and we're faced with complexity of choice, something in the brain makes us reach for the pack that looks like it's got more cookies in it. So people say one thing and they do another. So this is understanding this behavior is fundamental to marketing. Another example here, I'm going to ask you to do something now. Here is, here's a price reduction, eight pounds down to 5.99, but shown two ways, as you can see. Now objectively, of course, they're identical because the price reduction is the same. But I'm going to tell you that one of them significantly outsold the other. And I'm going to ask you to choose which one. So put your hands up if you think the price ticket on the right sold more. And who thinks the price ticket on the left? Perfect, thank you. You're a perfect audience. 50-50 split. <laughs> And I showed this at a retail marketing conference to people who take decisions like this every day of their lives. How do I show a price reduction online, in store, in print, or whatever communication medium it is? So how are you going to decide? Who takes the decision? Well, I like this. Well, I like that. And you, each of you in the room who've got different opinions, you're all right. You've both got valid, cogent reasons to support your argument. Who's going to decide in the end? The client. And who within the client's going to decide? Because they're going to have the same issue you've just had, people voting for left or right. My argument is that we can avoid these lengthy, time-consuming, subjective, opinionated debates by turning somewhere else, by turning to fields of, would you believe it, science. Because science knows that there are, if I asked a scientist which of these would sell more, he would tell me there are three effects that favour the ticket on the right. The way the brain processes numbers, a principle known as anchoring, and the way the brain processes price. So what happened in reality? Significantly more sales for the price ticket on the right, and people who bought that one rated the discount to be higher as well. So my argument here is that what is really going to affect output and outcomes and deliverables and money, commercial results, is by helping, uh, helping learn from science what changes behavior. And we practice what I call decision science, which is deliberately a blend of neuroscience, cognitive social psychology, and behavioral economics. Because individually, of course, they're all very interesting, and they all have interesting insights. Collectively, you get a really good holistic view of consumer behavior. Um, and there are other areas in society that are already looking at this. You may have heard of the so-called nudge unit in the UK government, which is now exported to other countries. Even Obama last September issued a, uh, a man made it mandatory to use behavioral science to serve the American people in public policy. So this is 
becoming part of, uh, of the fabric of what we do. And this is what you guys need to understand. It also applies to the commercial world. And this was the moment that made me switch my career from client side to becoming part of this. I was, uh, worked with Decode on the relaunch of the T-Mobile brand throughout Europe. And the first manifestation of that was a Liverpool Street flash mob dance ad in the UK. This ad had no product message, no proposition, no price message, no promotional message, no call or network quality message, yet it was the single most successful TV ad in the history of UK telco market. Sales went up 49%, shared by 6%. We increased penetration and frequency, which I've been told was impossible. You could do one or the other, but not both. We tripled brand consideration. And in terms of social, 40.5 million YouTube views is quite good. We then applied the same principles behind that advert uh, to other brand touch points, the look and feel of the stores, the proposition development, and even customer service interactions. And over the period of the next two years, we halved customer churn, which is an enormous impact on the bottom line in, in telecoms. And we went from fourth in the market for customer satisfaction to joint top. So this stuff works, and other companies are applying money to this now. So we're working with people like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Kentucky Fried Chicken, SAB Miller, to name but a few. This is where the smart money is going. Now, we have this guy to thank for a lot of it. I'm sure you recognize, I'm sure you've read his book, Professor Daniel Kahneman, who wrote an a, a international bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. And Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences in 2002 for his work on decision making. And he talked about two systems of decision making. Um, I've actually found a lot of people have, uh, have been a victim of one of those systems of decision making because they've just pigeonholed what Kahneman says into an existing paradigm. So they just think of his system one as emotional and his system two as rational. And I have to tell you, if anyone says that to you, they haven't understood Kahneman. Because if I tie my shoelaces, that's a system one activity. It's automatic, it's intuitive, it's spontaneous, it's implicit, it's been learned. But tying my shoelaces is not really emotional, is it? Or walking around is a system one activity. You wouldn't call that emotional. It's all about automatic mental processes versus controlled mental processes. I'm going to ask you to do something now that will help you um, experience the difference between these two systems. So I'm going to show you a series of coloured words on the screen, um, but before I do that, I wanted to just promote Daniel Kahneman's latest venture, which of course is an aftershave, because DK intuition is probably where he's now, where he's now heading, because he's become so famous. But now I'm going to show you these colour words on the screen, and I want you to call out loud, as quickly as you can, the colour of the word you see on the screen. That's it, simple, just the colour. And I'll give you a, a clue, the first one is red, okay? Are you ready? Let's go. Red, black, black red, green, blue, yellow, blue, red. Oh, come on, guys. Okay, so I'm not just telling you dry abstract theory that won a Nobel Prize, you've experienced it, you've felt this uh, clash between the controlled and the automatic mental systems. Now, this is fundamental when it comes to marketing, as this experiment shows, because we obsess about uh, people engaging with our brands and getting emotional resonance and things like this. This experiment shows the brain scans of the same person faced with different images of brands. Now, the task was choose a brand to buy. And what they did before they showed people in this experiment uh, pairs of brands in photographs, they asked them to name their favorite brands in a number of different categories, and also other brands of, uh, which they would also buy. So their consideration set, their purchase set, if you like. So what the scientists knew was which is this person's favorite and which are other brands that are not the favorite, but they would also buy. And then they paired at random, they paired photographs and showed them to uh, people in the brain scanner and said, look at these brands and choose a brand to buy. And here's the brain's reaction. Now, Decode asked me, they showed me this when I was their client. They said, Phil, look, you know, you spent years building brands. Which is the brain's response to the, to the favorite brand? And I said, oh, come on, guys. Is this a ridiculous question? 
I've, you, you build brand equity, you build emotional resonance, you build all of this engagement. Of course the brain's going to respond. It's the one on the left because that's where all the neurons are firing and where all the blood oxidation is going. But guess what? It's not. The brain on the left is thinking, which brand should I buy? The brain on the right has seen its favourite and decided just like that. So despite us talking all this lovely narrative about in emotional engagement, etc., etc., actually what the brain is doing is buying based on a no-brainer decision. <laughs> a favourite brand becomes a shortcut, it becomes a default, and the brain loves that because it's the most efficient way to make decisions, because it burns the least amount of energy. And that's exactly why this whole System 1 thing has evolved over millennia to be a very efficient user of energy because energy is important the brain consumes a lot of energy and we need energy for survival not for buying brands for something much more important to survive and so we will make this as efficient as we can so how do we deal with this these are the things that you you guys need to to know well here's a framework that we use that builds upon Kahneman for how we manage this so over on the left hand side you've got everything you're doing you're creating touch points for your clients, whether it's digital or atomic, whatever form it is, sponsorship, packaging, it doesn't matter. Those represent data coming into the brain. And over on the right-hand side, we have behavior. <coughs> Hopefully the behavior that we want. But in between those two points, we've got the brain, which we've just simplified in terms of three steps of processing. Firstly, you have attention and perception. You have to get into the brain in the first place. It goes probably goes without saying that consumers don't read your strategy papers. All they can deal with are the perceptible and tangible stimuli that come to them. And out of sight is quite literally out of mind. So what I find, and I, I was guilty of this as a marketeer, you spend a lot of time worrying about the right-hand end, about the, the motivation and the persuasion end, and we often ignore the left-hand end. You've actually got to get into the brain in the first place. And I'm going to show you an example in a moment of that. Then we have intuitive understanding or cognition. So here the brain is taking the data that comes in through our five senses and it's turning it into meaning. And this all happens subconsciously and it happens automatically and it happens in milliseconds. So the brain is using its associative memory that we've built up from birth to make sense of all the data coming in. Metaphorically asking two questions. What is it? What does it represent? Where do I know this thing from? And then finally we get persuasion, which could be based on just a, a fast decision rule we call a heuristic or, or a nudge, as they've commonly termed, or it can be goal-based decisions, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's just have a quick look at some of the things that science can help us with and that you can help your clients with. So we're going to look at attention and perception very quickly. So if I show you this, what jumps out? The Q, absolutely. The Q jumps out up there. I'm a bit disappointed. I hope you might say the F, which is over here. <laughs> but no, the reason you didn't spot that is because of a hard and fast scientific principle that our attention snaps to things that contrast with the surroundings. Contrast in colour, in shape or in size. And that's why you looked straight at the cue. That's why the cue jumped out. Now, visual neuroscience knows this so well that it's even possible now to write some software to replicate what your eyes just did. And this is, this is a tool that we use. We used it with a client, British Telecom, who had a piece of direct mail that wasn't working for them. And when we used this tool, which you can see here with the hot spots of attention, we said the problem with your material is the face at the bottom. Because we, again, a hard principle from science, there's nothing more rewarding to the human brain than another human being, in particular faces we will pay attention to. And it's sucking attention away from the call to action, which is those roundels on the right-hand side in the middle of the page. So quick and dirty solution, we said to the client, take the face off. Because then the principles of contrast kick in and look where attention goes now, straight to the call to action. So that's what the theory says. Let's see if it worked in, in practice. What actually was the, was the outcome? Well, British Telecom tested this, did A-B testing, and the one on the right increased response rate by nearly a third. And they send out millions of mailings. So that is a, not a trivial increase in response rate. So you can get people to look where you want them to look. 
and you can use that to drive sales. So why wouldn't you want to know this sort of stuff as, as an agency? We did exactly the same with, by changing the layout of one of their print ads. We didn't change the offer. The offer was identical before and after. We simply changed the layout and call volumes went up 27%. So this is powerful stuff. Let's have a quick look at, uh, at the middle block now um, about cognition and understanding. So another question for you, which of these would sell more? Right, okay, yeah, you're right. The one on the right has a 20% higher purchase intention. The reason being that the majority of people in the population are right-handed. And what happens when you see that image, you, you, you can't stop this happening. Your brain automatically simulates picking up that fork. <laughs> so what happens if your art director is left-handed? <laughs> yeah, this is stuff you should, you should know about. And, it, and, it's, and it's quite simple and it's quite easy to apply, but look at the commercial impact that it has. Why would you not want to know about this stuff? This is a principle known as fluency, which is the ease of mental processing. The brain loves things that are easy to process. And another way to do that, because we can't go advertising and putting our brand, clients' brand names everywhere, is to use what we call iconic assets. So these are things that can evoke the brand without the brand being the brand name being present. They could be colors, shapes, they could be sounds, they could be fragrances. Um, uh, certain phrases, certain celebrities, but they have the ability to evoke the brand. Now, you've never seen that particular um, Coca-Cola logo up there because it doesn't actually spell Coca-Cola, but your brain immediately jumped to it because of the flowing script and the red colour. We have a way of testing this we call branding power score, and here are some examples of branding power score from on the right hand side, this is, this is the activation of the correct brand. So the Apple logo, not surprisingly, scores very highly. And let's have a look at the other brands underneath it. We have the Magnum ice cream bar shape. We have the Coca-Cola bottle. Um, the one in the middle is not Qantas Airlines. Actually, a lot of people think that, but it's actually Foster's Lager. Then, a bit difficult to see, that's a Stella Artois advert. Andy McDowell from L'Oreal, and then finally, oh dear, a negative branding power score for Dolce & Gabbana's fragrance, The One. The reason being that about 20 years ago, Calvin Klein launched CK1, and they now own the word one. So if you're Dolce & Gabbana, every dollar I spend promoting that fragrance activates my competitor. Every dollar because I have a negative branding power. So you have a strategic choice. What do I do with this? Do I continue to invest and hope that I build that activation, or do I actually change the name or drop it? Here's a really nice example as well from Magnum. They're just the bar shape, no other element of branding, just the shape has a 90% activation of the brand, a very low activation of competitors. But look over here. This is a haagen advert. Now again, science tells us that the average dwell time on a print ad is about 2.1 seconds. This is a double page spread. Over on the right hand side, we already know the principle of contrast is going to make people pay attention to that bar shape and guess which brand it activates. Oops. So again, as a client or the agency, wouldn't you want to know this? Because you want to know where to place your bets. You want to know what's going to evoke the brand uh, above the line and through the line even in store. Now then, finally, we're just going to look at goals because as a marketeer, this is the most important bit for me um, of everything that I learned um, about decision science. This is a, a very important neuroscientific experiment done at Stanford where people were put in brain scanners and they were shown images of different products and brands for four seconds. Then they were shown the price for four seconds, and then they were given four seconds to make a purchase decision. Press a button, yes or no, will you buy that brand for that price? And what the neuroscientists wanted to do was just observe what happened in the brain at those different points in time. And what happened was very, very interesting, and for us, fundamental and significant. Because when people see a brand, the so-called reward center in the brain is activated. Now this was significant because the scientists already knew from many other experiments that when this part of the brain is activated, there's a very high probability that action will follow. And that's plausible, isn't it? We see something that's rewarding to us, we want it. We want to approach it, we want to acquire that thing. When you show a mother an image of her children, the reward center in her brain is activated. 
So brands are very, very powerful things in, in the brain. What happened when people saw the price? Something very different, the pain center in the brain. <laughs> Yeah, literally, this is the same part of the brain that's triggered if you, if you cut yourself, if you fall over and hurt yourself. So price is hot in the brain. I mean, the, the brain is metaphorically saying, that's really nice, I want that, it's ple pleasurable and rewarding, but ouch, I have to give away money, that's loss aversion. It hurts me to acquire the, uh, the reward or the pleasure. And then what happened was a trade-off, and if the reward activation was sufficient to overcome the pain activation, then the person pressed yes, and if it wasn't, they pressed no. And the scientists could predict, just watching the levels of activation, which button they were going to press. And this is what we call the net value of a purchase equation. And in, in our industry, it gives us two very powerful levers to pull. We have the reward lever and the pain lever, and we can pull those to make the net value of the equation positive. Now, rewards are absolutely fascinating because essentially rewards are brand equity. Rewards are the reason why when you give people Pepsi and Coke in a blind tasting test, the majority prefer Pepsi. But when you brand it, look what happens. The majority prefer Coke. Even, by the way, if it's Pepsi in the glass, but you've told them it's Coke. Because that has changed their perceptions. And for them, that perception is reality. Well, for all of us, perception is reality. It has changed their subjective experience. But what is that thing that you know, we've always wrestled with this woolly, intangible brand equity thing? And it is all about rewards. And I've, we've got a way now to, to quantify it. Because achieving our goals is rewarding for the brain. And what I found fascinating talking to my colleagues in DECO, who are all scientists and academics, I would say to them, how do you know this stuff? And they'd look at me blankly and say, but Phil, how come you don't know this stuff? Because you know, we've been dealing with this, this is a study that was done 20 years ago, or everybody knows this particular principle. And this is a fabulous body of science, goal-directed behavior. People saying, and, and all agreeing, whether it's neuroscience or, or cognitive or social psychology, all agreeing that human behavior is, is goal-directed. The other thing that's really interesting for me, before I tell you about what the goals are, is that it struck me that many of the metrics that we use client side are outcome metrics. So things like meaningful brand or brand love or some other brand attachment or purchase intention or what attitudes, whatever it might be, they are all the results, they are all the outcomes of some other process. And that other process is goal achievement. Because if I, if I talk to clients now and they say, oh, I, I need to boost my score on meaningful brand and I say well what's the meaning behind meaningful they look at me a bit blankly or what drives brand love what do you mean by brand love why does your customer love your brand and and by the way your competitors customer also gives the same brand love score to their brand but for different reasons so what are those different reasons and again you get blank faces so some of these outcome measures like meaningful brand are actually meaningless unless you come back upstream and understand what's driving that outcome. And that outcome is goal achievement. So what science tells us about goals is there are three fundamental drivers in terms of neuropsychology in, in the brain. There's autonomy goals, security goals, and excitement goals. Autonomy goals are all about who's the leader of the pack. This is about power, superiority, recognition, status, self-esteem, and self-confidence. Security goals are all about closeness, warmth, belonging, tradition, trust, care, warmth. And excitement goals are the novelty-seeking system in the brain. This is why I have a real issue when people talk to me about millennials, because actually millennials show exactly the same uh, behaviours as the previous generation did, and the previous generation to that, and the previous... And all the ones in the future will, by the way. Every decade they'll show the same, because we all are driven by the same goals. These don't change in a decade. These have evolved over millennia. So excitement is novelty-seeking, it's curiosity, it's about zest for life, hunger, vitality, and looking for new sensations and, and new experiences. Now, the link between this and brands is actually very simple, because... When thousands of years ago men beat each other over the head with clubs to determine who was the leader of the pack, nowadays we do exactly the same, but we do it symbolically through the cars we drive and the clothes we wear and the watches we wear, because otherwise 
we'd all drive the same cars, we'd all wear the same watches and the same clothes because they'd all, they'd all be the same, wouldn't they? Functionally, virtually identical. But of course we don't because we've come to associate those and our system one associative memory has built associations between brands as being instrumental in helping us to achieve our goals. Um, and as a business, we've developed this further into a map which is, has six areas on it, which is populated with a number of goals within, within the map. It's not shown here. But we need to be careful how we measure this stuff because coming back to Kahneman's System 1, System 2, here's an example of measurement because traditionally a lot of our market research measures have only tapped into System 2. So here's a live example from one of our clients, a banking client. On the left-hand side, what you see are a bunch of brand attributes, and then the first data set is their tracking study, measuring them versus a competitor. The data set on the right are the same attributes, but now using a different technique. This is an implicit measurement technique that accesses and measures system one in the brain. So this is looking at the automatic, spontaneous, intuitive response. And look at the differences in the data sets. The implicit set is far more sensitive to the real differences between the bank brands. And in some cases, the data points are actually reversed. And this is significant because up to now, you and your clients are using a data set on the left to plan activity and to make strategic choices and to allocate budgets, whereas consumers' brains are working with the data set on the right. So this is why it's very important to understand. Now, we use this type of measurement and this model to help not just strategically to understand what drives category purchase and brand purchase and brand relevance and distinctiveness, but also at an executional level to test advertising and output. Now, many of you will, will remember the Cadbury's Gorilla campaign, very, very famous campaign. I doubt many of you will remember its successor called Trucks which came out soon afterwards, written to the identical brief, same creative team, same director, and it completely died. Sank without trace. Uh, and we measured both ads, and it's obvious when you measure the goals with which they're associated, you can see in the spider chart on the left-hand side, just how differently those ads perform, despite the brief being identical. And on the right-hand side, the fit with purchase drivers was also very different. So it's really good to understand what is really driving purchase, and um, what is being signalled to this autopilot system that is being picked up that uh, we might otherwise miss. Similarly with, um, with T-Mobile, part, part of Deutsche Telekom, we still work with Deutsche Telekom throughout Europe, and the relaunch was based on doing exactly this type of work. We also found a positive and strong correlation between goal achievement and loyalty cohorts as well which was fascinating and, of course, then led back to, to revenue. So finally, let's just have a look at the question I posed at the beginning. How could uh, a big marketing company like PepsiCo make such a terrible mistake with the relaunch of, of uh, Tropicana packaging? And I'm going to use just a couple of examples from what I've shown you um, to explain this. The first is what happens when we shop a supermarket? Now, what you see at the bottom here are blurred images of the two packs at the top. And the reason I've blurred them is deliberate. It's because it replicates our peripheral vision. Because don't forget, when you're working with material and when you present material to a client or it's stared at for two hours in a focus group, you are giving it your full undivided attention in pin sharp focus, 20-20 vision and full colour. When I'm walking down a supermarket aisle oh, like this, the majority of what I see is out here. It's peripheral vision, 120 degrees, and as we go to the periphery, it becomes blurred. And if you don't believe me, when you read my book, look in the margin, see if you can read the words two or three centimetres to the left or the right, and you can't because they're blurred. So a simple tip for you, you can do this in PowerPoint, blur images of material you produce, give it to someone who doesn't know what it is, and say to them, what is it? To see if it's perceptible. Now, what happens under those conditions is, as you can see, the iconic assets of Tropicana with the old pack still come through. They're still perceptible. That orange you can see very, very clearly. On the right-hand side, pff, what is it? Who is it? Which brand is it? Is it own label? I have no idea. It just merges into a bland mess. The second thing is when you, when you measure these brands at an implicit level, you can see they're associated with very different goals. 
the original pack on the left, the, the signals on that pack, the codes on that pack are about freshness, naturalness, realness. You can't get fresher than an orange just picked off a tree and a, and a straw stuck straight into it. Whereas the pack on the right is orange served in a fluted wine glass. And the brain's think, recoding this. Where do I know this from? Where do I, where do I recognize orange served in a fluted wine glass? Special occasion, brunch, business meeting, wedding, bucks fizz. That's not how you serve orange juice to the kids on the breakfast table. So the change in, in um, graphics signals a very different meaning to the autopilot. So those are just two of the reasons why it failed. Now, when we, do, we did this with... Um, BT and you know you can go into clients with some of this science background and it's now not just a question of trust me it's here's what science tells us it gives you much more gravitas and authority to be able to sell work to clients because you've got science on your side and when we did this with BT these increases in response rates were the highest in living memory at that client they told us which is very nice so if you want a deeper look, you have my book. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Please give me your feedback. I'd love to hear your feedback. If anyone wants to take this further with us, we do training, we do consultancy, we do research. Very happy to take any questions over lunch. By the way, I'll still be here for lunch. So just thank you now from me for your attention.